So welcome to our talk, how can UX affect your SEO? I'm Nick Duffield, I'm user experience designer for a company called eLife Sciences in Cambridge. My path to UX is a very typical one. I started off as a graphic designer, first of all, made my way into web design and then transitioned into UX design. Some of the companies I work for are people like Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Um, I developed websites and mobile applications for that company, for their research groups and both their marketing departments. Um, right now, I work creating tools for scientists to help them communicate their work. So, today's talk, we're going to tell you about an SEO project that both Camilla and I worked on. Uh, in particular, the types of things that we learned doing this type of work and the insights that we gained. I think the interesting thing about the project is that we challenged our own ideas about SEO. Uh, we found that our own discipline of UX design, it played a bigger, a bigger part in this stuff than we initially thought. Um, I think a good place to start is for Camille to give you his perspective on what UX design is. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camille. I'm an experienced designer at Cambridge English. Um, I work on digital tools for, I help to build digital tools for learners and teachers. And um, my background, same like Nick's, is in graphic design. I've been doing this for over a decade now, working on both printed and digital media. And how I transitioned to experience design, or maybe the better question is why I transitioned to, to, to experience design, is because of the situation I'm about to tell you. So one day I, I was given a brief for, um, for, to design a poster. And it was pretty simple, create an artwork for the event, include information of what it is, when it is, where it's going to be held. Simple job, quickly completed the, 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 the job and handed over for, for approval. And three days later, eventually, I managed to get some feedback from, from the stakeholders. And first thing, they asked me to make logo bigger. It's like, because the logo cannot be big enough, yeah? <laughs> and then they say, can you move the headline a little bit to the top? And the support thing is a little bit to the left. And I'm thinking to myself, what difference is it going to make? Why are you doing this? Like, and it's pretty much the same story throughout my career. There's always seemed to be a person who was a specialist and knew better how to design and they knew how to do it better than me. And it always made me think, um, why do they do it? How can I prove that my work and what I do works? And um, so I started researching on, on the internet how, how to prove, how, how to communicate my designs better, how to, how to create designs that work. And more, more often, I started coming across um, user experience design. So I started learning and, and reading about it, got into it, and pretty much that's how I got my transition to experience design. But what is experience design? So it's, it's a design process. It's a process where all the decisions are based around user needs and their behaviors. And today we're going to focus on mainly three elements, because there's plenty of stuff that, that, that's included in experience design. But today we're going to focus on three elements that I think may have the biggest impact on your SEO ranking. So it's interaction design. Oh, I should have done it earlier. <laughs> interaction design. Um, information architecture, and <coughs> UI design, commonly known as interface design. And some of the tools I use on a daily basis uh, to achieve a great ar uh, information architecture or great visual designs are stuff like uh, user research, user surveys, uh, interviews, card sorting exercises, or competitive analysis. And one great tool, one more tool that, that I tend to use, this is more internal stuff. If, if before you go outside is uh, uh, workshop, design workshops. This is uh, trying to invite people from not only your own department where you work, but trying to get people from other departments and, and brainstorm some, some ideas. And by having people who, who are not familiar with the product that you are working on, you kind of get a, a, a different perspective. Uh, and you can see how others understand product you're working on. And it's quite helpful. And how the UX and SEO are connected, how the two work together, um, uh, I'll let Nick to share his uh, insights and findings. So, an idea for a project, SEO and UX. Um, I'd been doing uh, a lot of training and, and stuff like that and um, trying to figure out how to turn research insights gathered through tools like Google Analytics and feed that into my design process. Um, I mentioned to Camille that I was interested in this type of stuff. Um, and he suggested that I look at a course called The Digital Garage by Google. 
So I don't know whether you're familiar with this course, but it's, it's very basic and it's aimed at very small businesses to increase their presence on the internet. Um, while working through the course, a few things stood out to me. Firstly, the course recommended creating and crafting content in a meaningful way for your site visitors. In UX, we call this information design or information architecture. I think Camille just mentioned something about that too. Um, it also recommended speaking to your customers and understanding how they describe your content and, and speaking to them so that when you do write and create this content, you do it in a more meaningful way to them. It's just typical user research that we do it all of the time and we use that to inform our design process. Um, on top of that, it recommends optimizing your site. And that's what they mean by that is, is making it work in an expected way for users. And you know, like it, when you make your, your journey through a website, clicking links and hitting buttons and all of that stuff, that's just typical interaction design. It's just textbook UX. So when we're getting started on the project, um, we needed a guinea pig. Um, and what we wanted to do was speak to a local business and see if they would let us use their site to, to figure all of this stuff out and try new skills. Um, our hope was to, we were going to improve their site. Um, getting started, we had a few questions. We knew the store um, that, that, we, um, that we were looking for would, have, would need to have poor, ind poor indexing. If it did, we needed to know why that would be. Um, if users found these sorts of pages, we'd need to know how they use them. Um, if, competitors were cheap, if competitors are doing better with their indexing than, than them, we need to figure out what that would be. Um, so with the, all of these questions, we had a basic outline for our project. Uh, we went and proposed this to a friend of mine who, who had a failing business. Um, he had good footfall, but the actual website that he had wasn't performing very well. Um, to kick the project off, we divided um, all of this work into interests for, for both myself and Camille. He carried out certain parts of the project, um, things like analyzing Google Analytics. I was interested in, in the Google Search Console to figure out uh, why, why this guy's site was indexed so badly or, or their, um, their ranking was poor. Um, and uh, we, we proposed all this stuff to the guy and, and he was interested and, and we said, look, here's the deal. We're going to learn stuff by performing all of these things on your site. Um, and as a trade, what we'll do, we'll write a report up and share this with you and you can do what you want with it. You can give that to a developer. If he wants to make those changes, that's great, and that's, that's pretty much the trade we made. Um, I think it's uh, probably a good time for Camille to tell you about the types of work that he was engaged in while doing that stuff. So we kicked off with looking at, they gave us access to the analytics dashboard, and we kicked off by just having a general overview of uh, how the website performs. So we, we compared the data from 2015 and 2016, and the things we wanted to search for potential problems, look at the flows. Uh, we wanted to learn how, how many visits they get, how often the visits happen, and, and the conversion, the basic conversion rate. Um, and f the key findings from just looking at analytics, we, we learned that the, the visits to online store and the, the, the physical store were pretty much, there was no surprises there, it pretty much matched. So there was highs in January and December for, for, for the sell period, then slight dip, uh, a slight increase in sales again over the, uh, the summer period because this extreme um, sports shop. So, so kind of a match this, there was no surprises. We, we had a look at demographics and from demographics we learned that most of the visits were quite local, which again, although sad, it wasn't anything that, that would surprise us because we knew that they ranked quite poorly so we didn't expect the website to, to, to reach uh, distant customers. But, but the, the big stuff, the big discovery, it was like a golden nugget, at least for us. They had a 90% dropout rate at the checkout. That's one out of 10 people completing a purchase. Obviously it was horrible news for the owner, but great news for us. For us it was another piece of research we could do. Uh, prepared some, uh, hopefully work, some, work on some fixes and, and, and improve it. Um, so we gathered all this insight, presented it to, to, to Nick's friend, and we told him what we would, have, would like to do next. 
and he agreed for us to carry on with the project. The first thing we did, with help of the guys in the store, we organized a day of in-store usability studies. So um, we got the script ready, because it's useful to run studies by a script. We divided our roles. Uh, Nick was the interviewer, I was observer and note taker. And we set up a goal. And the goal on that day was to learn why people were dropping at the checkout. And on top of it, we thought, by observing, we can learn how people are, are using the website in general. Uh, we managed to get um, eight, eight or nine uh, subjects, I mean subjects, people actually who went to come to the store. Um, and we asked them to purchase a product using their website, whether they wanted to use their mobile device or we had a tablet available and a computer. I asked them to search for the product they come to buy and complete the purchase using an um, online store. And the insights we got from this, we, we, we learned why there was a dropout rate. Because um, people couldn't first, they couldn't find the checkout button. Second thing, once they found it, they couldn't identify the pay button because it didn't look like a button. Um, another thing we learned uh, as an extra, it took quite a long time and significant, significant amount of pages for, for people to scroll through to get to the desi desired item. And there was a sm small problem with them. Um, oversized cookie message. So it just pretty much would fill the whole screen on a mobile device. So we knew what's wrong, then we had to fix it. So we again split the duties. Uh, Nick uh, was going to go and create a, a set of wireframes to present a new checkout procedure, a new button, how it would uh, look. And um, what I wanted to do is to work on the information architecture of the website that I was hoping is going to reduce the search time um, of the items. And in ideal world, where you have budget, stuff like that would be probably uh, best to do with a group of 20 people in, in, in a room like this and, and do something we call card sorting exercise. But as our project was more, was more for us to learn, it was pro bono, we didn't have no budget, our budget was zero. We had to be quite creative on it. So I thought, as the saying goes, good designers copy, great designers steal. And I'm a great designer, I'd like to think. So, but I don't like using... the best. Yeah. <laughs> Shh. But in the design world, we don't call, in the UX world, we don't call it stealing. We call it recycle, recycling of well-understood patterns. Yeah? So the best way to do it on the cheap, as in for free, um, I took top ranking four competitive websites scan the, uh, the website, check how they group the items, how, the, how they uh, structure their information, uh, mapped it out and looked for overlapping patterns. And based on the findings, I designed a brand new architecture for, for the shop we're working for. And because in a situation like that, there's no sense uh, reinventing the wheel. Those guys ranking on the top, which means they customer like it, it works for them, it's going to work for us. And I'm, I'm going to let Nick now speak about the, the whole journey of um, wireframes and Search Console. OK, so for my part, the Search Console, it threw up a, a couple of re recommendations, stuff that need fixing. So that what had happened is the staff, when they're creating new pages, have been doing a typical save as type of thing. Um, and, and what they hadn't been doing was changing the page titles, things like the meta descriptions and the keywords that are associated with these pages. So. Uh, 65 pages had duplicate page titles, uh, 822, I don't know how they managed to get that number, had duplicate meta descriptions, and there was just like an abundance of duplicated keywords there. Um, it just, it resulted in completely inaccurate page information for search results. Um, Google called this out, I, I made a report for these guys, and um, tried to write content in a structured way so that they could use it, because don't forget, these guys are just regular shop owners. They don't know anything about design. They don't understand programming or, or any of that stuff. They don't really know anything about websites. So what they needed was a, a structure that they could follow and work with when they were creating their content. So my proposed fix was this. Um, for, for each page title, to start that off with uh, the brand of the item, the name of the item, and then uh, separate that with a hyphen and then describe the item in some way. That could be a detail of some sort. In this instance, that was the color. 
and then to reference the, the title at the very end with the actual store name. So the neat thing is about this, it gave them a very, very simple structure to follow and they could just roll these things out as they needed to, which cut down on all this duplication that they were seeing. Um, hopefully that would, that would result in um, better indexing, better ranking hopefully, and um, it, it should fix their problem. And then, you know, my advice was to, to do this for a couple of sections of your website and see how this goes. And, and if you start to see an improve, improvement in your, in your indexing and ranking and stuff like that, then you know you're doing something right and you can continue this out through the rest of the site. Uh, another thing that I had to help with was this, this checkout experience issue that these guys had had. So what was going on there is that um, they had key call to actions just buried in sidebar navigation. So it was just like a, a regular old link, but it was the most important thing on a page. Um, what, what we found customers were doing is that they knew how to add items to their shopping cart but they just couldn't get to the checkout because this thing was just a minor link like in their peripheral vision. Um, so a fix for that was a set of wireframes. I mean, they don't look like anything special. We, we didn't have time um, or budget to do any, any huge visual design improvements. I don't think they'd have accepted that sort of stuff even if we did because they, they had their way of thinking about their website. But what I suggested was, instead of turning this, this little button here, which is just a piece of text, leaving it like that, and then that sort of like highlighting or underlining in a very simple way, make that a huge great button. So when something gets added to a cart, this thing then lights up, and we get some sort of ribbon strip that gets tacked to the bottom of the browser window, showing that you've, you've added an, an item to your cart. There's a secondary button there, so if you miss that one, you're gonna be able to see that. And through that, you'll be able to navigate your way um, to the checkout and then pick your, your gateway of choice and then follow that through to make your payment. Um, by proposing this fix, we saw over the following month like a 20% a 20 increase in sales conversions, which was a massive win for those guys. So all of this work, we completed that. We handed our report to the shop. Um, we got the developer to do some of this work. Um, in our report, what we did, we, um, we prioritized the stuff that they needed to do um, in order uh, as fixes to their website. We, we said, we, we know you don't have time and money and experience and all of this stuff, so, so do what you can, right? Um, just doing one thing off this list is gonna help you. That was one of those things. Um, I think currently they're still working on improving their site, time, money, budget, people, all of that stuff, so. Um, you know, over the next year, hopefully they, they will get their site in order. Um, I think a key thing for them is, is better indexing. Um, what I did explain to them that um, being found is only part of the user's journey. Once they get to your site, they need to be able to know how to use it. The content needs to make sense. And it needs to work in a way that they expect it to, so they can, they can make purchases or, or do the things that they want to do. If it's a blog, they might want to read content and then find other bits of content that, that's of interest to them. So however you piece your site together, it, it should make sense. And the, the best way to do that sort of thing is to ask your customers what they want, understand the way that they think about your site, and then optimize your site accordingly. So I think, uh, a good thing to do now, I'll hand you back to Camille. He can give you some wrap up there. So thanks a lot. So I think um, for all of us, it's safe to say that although yeah, my job title is experience design, some of your marketeers, SEOs, I think it's safe to, to say that in, deep inside all of us are uh, user experience designer. Although our disciplines are slightly different, we have the same goal. The goal is to provide the, our customers and, and people who use our products with the best possible experience that we can get, with a, with, with, with this, leave them with a smile on their face. And we're hoping that they're gonna keep coming back to our, for our product for more and more. And um, all the stuff we describe um, and the research, it, although it sounds um, like it's time consuming and expensive thing to do, it's not really, as I told you, like you can do stuff like information architecture, you can do almost for free. And there's plenty of other resources <coughs> available on the web on, on the internet that can help you, other tools that can help you understand your users better. And as long as all the decisions you guys make 
are based around um, user behavior and their needs, you still have plenty of successes. And all it takes is start the conversation with, with, with your customers. And from my experience, people are normally quite happy to talk, especially if there's a problem. Uh, they, they will tell you how to fix it. You don't even have to think of it, because sometimes they already come up with a solution. And I said, as long as all the decisions are made around their needs, you should be fine. And one thing I think both of us would like you guys to take away from today's talk, optimize for the audience, not the search engines. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.